At the southern edge of China, near its border with Vietnam, the Yang Liu River wends its way down from the hilltops and through carefully tended rice paddies in the basin of Mengse. It reaches Shi Dong, with a rock cave so lofty and large it conjures the company of dragons. When the river waters rush beneath the shadow of these rocks, they vanish into darkness with a roar. The Yang Liu River is swallowed by the earth in a single gulp. Karst would be a good name for a dragon, with its harsh and mighty sound, but it's the name for the geological structures that turn a landscape into a sieve, where water rushes through thin soil and porous bedrock to seep into deep and hidden caverns and channels below. Imagine Swiss cheese or an elaborate labyrinth created by chemistry, physics, and water as it restlessly seeks the path of least resistance over eons. That water is essentially invisible to those above, bypassing their land and their needs. The Yang Liu is located in Yunnan, one of China's most ecologically diverse and economically challenged provinces. It's one of many rivers that journey long distances in secret. Much of China's water comes from karst regions, and worldwide an estimated one-fourth of the global supply flows from karst aquifers. Of them all, southwest China is commonly considered home to the greatest karst landscape on Earth. And here, the limits of water mark the boundaries of poverty, ecology, and opportunity. It's really estimated that there is as much as 500,000 square kilometers of this karst, and maybe as many as 80 to 100 million people that are uh, in, this, in this area. As many as 10 million people are dealing both with the environmental issues but serious quality of life issues because of the economic situation. And these are closely tied together. The Angliel River slips under the map at Shidong village and makes a dramatic entrance some 20 miles later at Nandong. In between, it travels in a northwesterly direction dropping more than 2,000 feet in elevation in its underground course. But its precise location is unfathomable at present, which makes each attempt to tap into its waters a very expensive shot in the dark. Along the route above lie settlements, mostly ethnic minorities, where people grapple with the challenges of karst, on the most basic level, their struggle is quite literally uphill. They live on a plateau in the accessible waters below in the basin. It must be pumped or, more commonly, carried up when cisterns or local reservoir ponds are dry. Fetching water dampens incomes, education, and health. It can also swell domestic tensions and erode essential family structures. The young men of Chibudi, like elsewhere in the area, are leaving to work in factories like those in Guangzhou. There is simply no way to earn enough from the land, which is still scarred from the deforestation that took place as a part of the Great Leap Forward campaign, which Chairman Mao launched in the late 1950s. Unanchored, the ever-fickle topsoil quickly vanished, leaving little to farm and even less to retain and filter water. This style of environmental degradation is known as rock desertification, and it amplifies the effects of the water cycle. In many cases, the surface landscape is now drier in the dry season and wetter in the rainy season, with more flooding and erosion without the natural buffer of the soil. Farming, always a wager with the weather, is losing ground, prompting the largest shift of population from rural to urban areas in human history, a shift that will also put its own demands on a tenuous freshwater supply. Over the last two decades, major karst springs have shown signs of degradation, and in arid places, they are the main local sources of water. Farmers worldwide have a way of making do. When the soil and water are scarce here, they subsist on staples such as rice, beans, corn, and sweet potato. When growing conditions are more favorable during the summer rainy season, then they grow fruit on the side as a cash crop, or perhaps tobacco to send to the booming cigarette factories in nearby Kunming. But these short-term solutions have lasting consequences. 
Tobacco requires using plastic sheeting to retain water, miles of plastic that is then dumped elsewhere. And farming crippled by a depleted workforce, lost to the cities, along with a stressed water supply and minimal soil, that against all odds kind of farming requires supernatural force. It comes in added fertilizer and pesticides that then leach even faster with less filtration down into the restless karst waters below. And from above, more knocking on the dragon's cave. In Kunming, the capital of Yunnan province, bulldozers are leveling the surface karst as they construct a new airport, the largest yet in the region. The plan is for this to become a massive area of growth, and the airport itself is hailed as an example of progressive green development. Field scientist and karst expert Liu Hong is at the Chilong, or Blue Dragon, cave spring. It's one of the drinking water sources of Kanming City. He says it faces many problems, including contamination from industrial and agricultural sources, and sediments from the airport construction are further degrading the water quality. In the macrocosmic sense, karst is a complex and fragile ecosystem intricately bound with a larger environment. But in many places here in Yunnan, the focus is small, sharp, and painful. Any water is good water. People launder and bathe in turbid lagoons, unable to reach the inscrutable river below them. They cache, they carry, they hope the pipes the government installed won't leak too much. Further north, in another community, local women have another approach. They chant on their knees in a new temple built to honor water. In China, the character for water is at the root of the character for political stability, and karst regions require a complex choreography of nature and man to maintain a sustainable balance, because humanity is positioned so near the fulcrum. Protecting and restoring this balance requires a keen understanding of how karst is made, how it functions, and how it changes. Yuan Daoshen began his career as a hydrologist with the very practical mission of coaxing water out of stone for people to drink and to farm. Very active in his late 70s, he's considered by many the grandfather of contemporary karst research in China, reaching across the world and through the generations to encourage exploration and scholarship. Uh, I think it is a very big job and a big area and the, 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 the job is very big, I think. I need many young people. To, and also I need the continuous uh, cooperation with foreign colleagues come together, <laughs> to work together. Yuan Daoshen has proven the strength of local involvement and the potential of the larger community. As colleague by colleague, he's nurtured international collaboration on karst studies. It is a very different and powerful kind of current flowing through karst, inspiring new insights and channeling new wisdom along the way. Perhaps not unlike the Young Leo River, year by year, seen and unseen, through air and rock alike, shepherding water, ceaselessly carving a path to illumination. <laughs>